five reasons why quiz funnel marketing sucks. Well, first of all, don't call it a quiz, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> give them a reason uh, to, you know, to take it, to give them some value. Yeah. Go ahead and go run through those real quick for me. Yeah. So um, it, it would suck if you didn't give people a self-interested reason to take the scorecard. If, if they think they're helping you versus helping themselves. Um, number two is asking the right number of questions, depending where they are in the sales cycle. Keep it light at the beginning build up if you're if you've got someone in the pipeline and then go all in if you've got a, a client that you want to track and measure um, number three is um, uh, giving value straight away so making sure that when someone completes answering the questions they immediately get custom recommendations custom insights that we do the personalization that the data is used for personalization that you're not just then they're not answering questions and then getting a generic response they're answering questions and getting a personalized response based on the data. Number four is promoting it effectively, plugging it into all of your marketing to create the two-way conversation. And number five is using the data uh, to, to, uh, to make more sales and to be more effective. Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang. Man, we're gonna have a good conversation because I have to actually share with you, uh, I was reached out um, to by an organization that wanted to interview me because a very large organization was wanting to understand the quiz marketing funnel landscape. And uh, it was really interesting, the questions that they were asking from their perspective. And it, and it really brought to mind the conversation that we're going to have today with Daniel Priestley. And that is, there's five reasons, and actually there's more than that, but we're going to talk about five main reasons why quiz funnel marketing sucks, right? Uh, and there's a several reasons for that. Again, we're going to, we can't get into all of them, but we're going to have some, a really good discussion with Daniel Priestley. Daniel, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. Appreciate it. And before we get into this discussion, if you could share with folks a little bit of your background and your expertise in this area. Yeah. So I'm Daniel Priestley. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of ScoreApp. ScoreApp is a quiz marketing uh, piece of software. Um, I'm an entrepreneur by background. I've been running and starting and growing and selling my own businesses for the last 20 years. I've written four best-selling books on entrepreneurship and marketing. Uh, here in the UK, I've won Entrepreneur of the Year and Business Advisor of the Year for major awards. Uh, I was born in Australia. Uh, I live in London and have done for the last 16 years, and I'm a dad with three kids. Yeah, and, and I think they're all actually little, little ones, aren't they? <laughs> Three-year-old, four-year-old, and seven-year-old. Yeah, they're little. <laughs> A whole lot of energy needed and uh um, I also non -stop, sleep. Non-stop, Jim. Non-stop. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> They're running the companies is the easy part. <laughs> exactly. And uh, oh, I tell you, uh, we had we had a good discussion actually being able to flesh out uh, these five things because uh, really even going back to that interview that I was um, participating in as I was reached out to by this organization, uh, there's just a whole lot of miss and dis information on quiz funnel marketing. Uh, and I think it's probably good to just go ahead and talk about the first one that you find, which is extremely common and where people make mistakes in regards to, and we almost, I, you know, after talking with you, I almost hate to say that it's quiz marketing or quiz funnel marketing or quiz. And, and I think that's your first one that you're going to talk about, isn't it? Yeah. So I would say don't call it a quiz is a good place to start. Um, and the reason for that is a quiz by definition is testing knowledge that you already have. And it's kind of testing recall is, is typically how people associate a quiz. So for example, if I said, what year did the Beatles break up? You might go, oh, it's 1969, right? So that's a quiz to, to kind of quiz you whether you know stuff. Um, and most of the time people think of quizzes as something that they might do for entertainment um, but it, they don't place a high value on, on just answering a quiz or they might do it as part of sort of um, testing their knowledge for, a, for an academic achievement or something like that. Um, so that would be part one. Another thing that people associate to is surveys. Surveys are where you, out of the goodness of your heart or in exchange for maybe a prize, you answer questions about yourself for the benefit of the person asking. So if somebody's asking you to fill in a survey 
and you think, oh, okay, fair enough, I'll give them a couple of minutes of my time in order for them to get something of value. And maybe they're going to share the survey data with me, maybe not, maybe they're going to give me a prize, maybe not, right? But people don't have strong value associations with the term quiz or survey. So a scorecard's a little bit different. That's why we've talked about uh, what we do as scorecards because scorecard is where people want to test whether they're on track or off track to achieving an outcome. It's something they want to achieve. So for example, if I said to you, are you ready to run the London Marathon? Uh, that would be, you know, something you might go, if you've got a goal to run the marathon, it's like, am I ready to run the marathon? Am I, am I prepared? Am I getting myself on track? And I might answer a marathon running scorecard to see whether you're on track or off track for that. Um, and, you know, this would be, are, are, you a, are you an effective CEO? Take the CEO scorecard, right? So that would be, I'm, I'm answering questions for my benefit. I want to I get the benefit. I want to know whether I'm on track for this thing. I want to know whether I'm going to succeed or not. I want to know if I'm improving or not, right? So if you think about someone who's like in sport, the, the scorecard is showing them whether they're improving or not and how they're doing, right? So that, you know, they're interested in it. So that's one of the first things that I would say that, that don't devalue this thing by thinking of it as a quiz or a survey. Don't devalue it in the eyes of the person taking it. Place a higher value on it and make sure people know that this is within their own self-interest to, to take this, to answer these questions and take this uh, assessment. So as you're talking, and I had this conversation with a group of folks yesterday, is that um, in today's world, when you start looking at the just sheer amount of noise that's out there, and for me, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, B2B marketing uh, yeah. and, you know, the COVID, the, the COVID situation, you know, you know, 50 X all the noise out there. Yeah. We, 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 we have no shortage of information. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's overflowing and it doesn't matter how good your stuff, your content, whatever you want to call it is, you're getting sucked into that vortex of noise. Okay. So if I, if I think about that, I really have to become a master in psychology in, in order for me to stand out and make a difference. And, and as you were explaining the positioning, as you were explaining the desired outcome piece and the value piece to me, I'm like, that's all psychology. Yeah. Well, marketing, marketing and running teams and connecting with markets is all psychology. You know, uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the research that I do that goes into the products that we create is psychological research. There's a guy called Professor Robin Dunbar who does amazing research papers on how people bond, how they make friendships, how they make decisions. Um, and it is all psychology, right? It's all the stuff that goes on behind our ears. And I do want to reiterate that point that you made. That from 2007 to 2015, 16, there was an explosive growth of social media. It was on the S curve uptick, right? It was that kind of vertical climb of, of the S curve. And you could go online, you could have a good message, you could be consistent, and you'd pick up thousands of followers, you'd pick up clients. All of that was great. That was a that was kind of like the glory days of social media. Um, but then around 2016, it started hitting maturity. And uh, essentially, everyone was on it and everyone was doing it. People tune out from it. So um, what, uh, not to deviate, because I know you've got a particular plan, but here's, here's something that's interesting. Separate from politics, right? I know that a lot of your listeners <laughs> don't want to hear politics, but separate from politics, the US presidential election is a fascinating insight into uh, how marketing trends evolve. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt did the fireside chat on national radio hundred years ago. And that moved from print uh, newspaper to radio as the dominant form. JFK did a um, live televised debate against Nixon in 1963. And that moved people from radio onto television as the dominant media. Uh, and then Obama 08 was the first major social media campaign which moved people from television to social media, showed that social media. So it's kind of like the Formula One where they create a like an ABS braking in Formula One and then they roll it out for, for the other cars. They create stuff that's at the cutting edge in the US presidential election and then other marketers pick up and do that. 2016 was data analytics. It was all about data analytics. It was Cambridge Analytica here in, in, in the UK and it was all about harnessing data and having cut through messaging based on data. And it was this idea that you could create an audience of one, you could tune into 
what each individual cared about and talk to them about their individual desires, needs, outcomes, and, and respond to people as individuals. And this was the birth of something called personalization in marketing, like in a, in a big way, in an automated way. So this is where we are right now. People who are just making noise online, they're in the last era. They're, they're, they're behind the game and they need to need to jump, jump forward. But as you, as you said that, I'm like, oh, but there's literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, you know, marketing gurus who are, you know, pushing and promoting all of that things you're talking about. It's like, no, 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 we are well past that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, but here, here's another thing that I think is extremely important is this isn't a full automation opportunity. What it is, it's really a blending and, and, a, and a, a hybrid approach. And even when you start talking about AI um, and artificial intelligence involved with all of this is, uh, you know, you talk about personalization. This is something that's we've been trying to do mass personalization, especially with consumer brands, you know, for decades, right? Uh, so now, you know, the, the thought is, you know, if I'm a B2B brand that, you know, I can do mass personalization as well, but I'm like, eh, no, you cannot automate a human relationship. It has to be an augmentation. It's a, yeah, you, you need to augment it. So imagine, imagine you meet someone at a, at a party and all they do is talk about themselves, right? And they just talking at you and they're saying, Hey, here's what I did. Here's my history. Here's about me. Uh, here's the products that I sell. Here's the here's our key the key people I work with, and they just run through all this information about themselves. And you're sitting there going, okay, that's nice. At what point are you going to ask any questions about me, right? Now, if we look at most digital um, personifications of you, your your personal footprint online, unfortunately for most people, it is that broadcast mentality. So. If I go to most websites, it's just going to say, here's all about us and the people who work here and our history and our products. That's all going to be on the website. Go looking at major websites and try and find any major websites other than the social media ones that are deliberately asking you and saying, tell me about you. Tell me more about yourself and let's connect based upon what you're up to in the world. Because here's the thing. If you go to a business website, well, it might be a business website, right? Like an accounting or legal site. But there's a huge difference between a startup with one employee and a scale up with 150 employees. Those are wildly different businesses. And you want to you want to know as fast as humanly possible. Am I talking to a startup who, call, who calls themselves a startup with one person or am I talking to someone who calls themselves a startup with 150 people? Uh, you know, th- because I'm going to have a very different conversation if I know that information. So you're trying to harness that. And the scorecard is one of the ways that you're encouraging people to disclose things about themselves, share with you, so that you can then personalize. You can then have have a sensible conversation based on the data. Well, you know, to me, you know, as you're talking and we're talking about augmenting and relationship building and psychology and all of those things, um, it, it gets into a whole lot of understanding uh, and insight in order for you to be able to create the proper strategy to build your tactics, right? Um, and so that starts getting into length of the scorecard and some other things. Talk to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so one of the next issues that people have when they don't get this implemented well is that the scorecard is not uh, fit for purpose based on just the length of the number of questions that you're asking people. So when you're talking to cold uh, cold traffic, let's call it. It's a horrible dehumanizing term, right? I don't like dehumanizing language, but it's it's common ground. So cold traffic, someone who's just arrived at the website, they don't really know who you are. Maybe they saw an ad, maybe they saw something on, on LinkedIn, they clicked on and they're now on your website. If you're looking at someone very much cold for the first time, you only really want to ask them something like seven to 15 questions on a quick scorecard. So you might just say something like, um, uh, take our cybersecurity scorecard to see whether your business is implementing 2022 best practices for cybersecurity, right? So you might just have a nice quick one. It says answer 13 questions and we'll give you a quick quick score on your cybersecurity setup. Um, now that's nice and fast. It's a minute to two minutes. People can answer a few questions. You want those questions to be very easy to answer. Have you got this? Did you have any IT outages in the last 12 months? Did your business shut down because of unplanned IT issues? Do you have someone 
on your team who resolves IT issues quickly 24-7, right? So those kind of things, you might want to just ask those nice quick questions that people can answer off the top of their head. And then you say, based on those answers, we think you are green light, yellow light, red light. We think you are an 18% um, with strong foundations, but room to improve, right? So you, you kind of want to make it nice, snappy, fast, and not too c- complex. If someone is warm, they've been following you on social media, maybe they're somewhere in your funnel or another dehumanizing word, right? They're somewhere in, in the pipeline or the journey. Um, and you're trying to warm that person up. You're trying to deepen the relationship. Uh, you've made initial contact with them, but now you're trying to kind of Uh, diagnose, look for an issue, look for a problem to solve. You're trying to better understand their needs. Now you might want to go for 20 to 50 questions. And this is where you might have some categories. So categories are like, like, you know, if you think about the scorecard, it has a main big outcome that customers want. And then there's some drivers that drive that outcome, or there's some categories that drive that outcome. Um, And like, for example, big outcome might be health and fitness, and a, dri- a driver might be diet, exercise, stress, sleep. So you can then, uh, with, with someone who you want to warm them up, you can ask, say, 20 to 50 questions that are broken down into a few different categories. And now you can give people category scores. So you can say your overall score for health and fitness is 27%, and that's increased by your exercise score, but it's decreased by your sleep score. You need to improve your sleep routine. Um, And also you've got high stress, but you've got a great diet, great exercise, but high stress and low sleep, that's what's causing you to not be as healthy as you could be. So this is where you start kind of diagnosing in on some categories that might need addressing. Um, And then finally, if you've got a client who's already paying and they've signed up and now you want to really kind of create a scope of work with them, you want to go on a 12-month journey, you want to be able to clock and measure how much impact you're having on that client, you might want to ask 50 to 100 questions and what you're looking for with, with a full diagnosis, a full assessment, is you're looking for almost a to-do list with that client. You want to be able to kind of ask 50 to 100 questions so that you have all this work to go do with them. Do you, know, do you have this in place? Do you have this in place? Do you have one of these? Do you have one of these? And the perfect scenario there is on day one of signing a deal with you, uh, they get like a 17%. Uh, and then on 12 months down the track, they're at 81% and they can attribute that to the work that you did with them. Okay. So I, I have to say, as you were running through that, I mean, it, of course it makes sense, but then I start looking at the potential daunting task and I'm like, is this really a DIY thing? We're talking about masters in psychology. We're talking about value creation. We're talking about differentiation. I'm like, ain't no freaking way. How's it even possible? Uh, how's it possible to set up a scorecard like this? Well, yeah. How can this be like a DIY thing? Well, yeah, to a degree, you've got to know your customers, right? You've got to be able to ask them questions. I would say that the scorecard is a little bit like that first conversation that you would have with someone. So if you were to record a salesperson talking to a prospect and they say, um, so tell me about your business. Do you, do you have many people on the team? Uh, how many people, you know, is it a small team? Is it a big team? Right. So that's a question. How many people do you have on your team? And they might say, um, do you guys run on Linux or do you run on uh, you know, a different server and, oh yeah, we, we run on Linux. Okay, cool. So you might just ask that question. Um, have you got someone on your team who handles your IT? Yeah, we do. We've got an in-house person. Okay. So you are, are, ask that. So you're asking things that can be improved and you're asking questions where there's either potentially a good answer or a bad answer. So jumping, I'm jumping between different concepts here, but keeping it really simple, health and fitness scorecard. Uh, do you get to bed at the same time each night? Uh, yep. Yes, I do. I've got a bedtime and I go to bed at the same time each night. Fantastic. That will give you a point for that. That That's a move in the right direction. If you say no, that's we'll take a point off. Um, and then we might say, do you use computers, phones, or iPads before bed, right before bed um, in, in your bedroom? Yes. Okay. Well, then we'll take a point off. No. Okay. We'll give you an extra point. So we can start asking questions around good behavior, bad behavior, good things that good things to do, bad things to do. And, um, and then we accumulate that into the score and into the categories. We have uh, little point systems, by the way, this might sound complicated when you actually see the software, it's super simple. You start with a template, all the questions are written, all the things are written for you and you just edit it, edit it to fit your business. 
Um, and you just kind of weight the questions if you want to weight them differently. What I mean by weight is the amount of points for a yes and the amount of points for a no. Um, and, uh, you know, look, of course, you've got to put an hour or two into it, but that would be true for a podcast. That would be true for writing a really good blog or an article. That would be good. F- that would be true for putting together a proposal to a client. So you block out an hour or two and, uh, and, and put together your scorecard. Uh, and then you've got yourself an asset that's going to that's going to sit there generating warm leads uh, or warming up existing leads uh, day in day out for the next twelve months. Okay, well, so that brings me to the question, um, and, and I and I think I kind of baited it a little bit, is making sure or ensuring this because this is one of the reasons of the failures, you know, why quiz funnel marketing sucks, you know, is that asking the wrong questions is a significant, you know, issue. And you, you kind of answered some of the components or elements of this and saying, you know, scripting and templates and thinking about the journey and stuff. But if you can simplify it, right question, wrong question. Yeah. Really, really what we're talking about here. So the right question is a simple question that people can answer yes or no to, um, or yes, no, maybe, or yes, no, sometimes. Um, and it's something that they can improve. If they're aware of it, they could improve it. So you might say, do you get to bed on time um, each night? Then that is something that it's very easy to answer yes or no, um, and it's also something that people could improve if they wanted to improve, right? And ideally, <laughs> we're talking about stuff that your business helps them to improve. So, you know, um, you know are you a great CEO? Uh, do you have regular team meetings? Uh, do you communicate the vision of your organization to every employee? Uh, do you have videos, audios, and written documents that help people to understand the vision, mission, and values of your organization? So these are things that people can improve if they want to. Um, they're things that maybe your organization might help them be able to improve, uh, and it helps them to identify a blind spot. So simple questions that people can answer off the top of their head, yes, no, maybe, or yes, no, sometimes, um, and um, and something that's not, that that they can improve with the help of your business. Okay, so um, we've been able to construct all this. We've set it up. We understand our flow. We understand our strategy. We're we're you know knocking all of those things off. You know, then then the other thing we have to really talk about is um, because again, it's noise. There, you're competing with. You're competing. The reality, I mean, you're not competing with the person who you're going to lose a sale to anymore. That, that, that is over. When you started talking about the whole S-curve thing and all that, what we compete with now is some, you know, is somebody else trying to get our target's attention. Yeah. yeah. Which you're, includes- you're competing, you're competing with like uh, political de- debates online. You're competing with uh, someone who's like- doing exotic dancing online and, you know, with a pop-up you're competing with, uh, you know, a guru who's talking about personal and professional development in a completely other area. Yeah, absolutely. We're in a messy world. Yeah. In addition, those three little kids you have at home. <laughs> <laughs> in addition, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then how, when you start talking about, you know, marketing and attention and also too, uh, but we didn't, you, when I started even thinking about, as you were mentioning, you know, something about these lengths and where people are within that, to just say relationship funnel is dropout rates, all of these things. I'm like, okay, so, you know, how do we promote this and then have it to be effective? Yeah. So we, we need to embed this into the, the marketing and what's happened over the last seven to 10 years is that most companies have gotten very good at broadcasting. So they've got, most companies have now got a blog or a set of articles that they promote. Um, they've probably got something that's audio like a podcast. They've probably got some videos out there uh, on YouTube or other platforms. Uh, they might be posting regularly on social media. Um, they've, you know, all of those kind of things. They might run some ads and they might also have their website that's, that's optimized for SEO. What you're really trying to do as fast as possible is you're trying to get people to go from reading something, listening to something or watching something to signaling intent, signaling interest by filling in the scorecard. You're trying to get them to answer some questions about you. So it's a two, suddenly it becomes a two-way street. I broadcast some content to you and you respond by answering some questions as a way of uh, starting the dialogue. So I'll, I'll share with you some of my ways uh, of how this happened. In fact, I'll share with you my personal story as to how I got into the whole scorecard thing uh, anyway. 
Um, in early 2010s, I was traveling around the world running big conferences and events. I was speaking. I'd written a book. Um, and I was a single bachelor. I had no kids in early 2010s. And um, and I loved traveling around the world speaking at big conferences, 500 to 1,000 people in a room. And it was really cool and really exciting, really expensive and, and time-consuming. But it was great. It's a good lifestyle. Uh, 2014, first kids coming along, and I'm thinking, how on earth am I going to make the money that I make when I can't, when I'm grounded, right? When I'm on the, when I can't do what I, I normally do. I rewrote my book, Key Person of Influence, and I put in there a link to a scorecard where I said, if you're enjoying the book and you want to get the most out of the rest of the book, then answer these 40 questions, and it will tell you how to um, focus your attention to get the most out of the book, um, and. We put that in early on in the book, and we also put a bookmark in that said, get the most out of this book, take this scorecard on the key person of influence scorecard. So we send out the books, and they've got that link in it, and they've got that bookmark in there, and suddenly people start filling in the scorecard. In fact, about 90,000 people filled in the scorecard, and tens of millions of dollars came off the back of it, and it was just unbelievable. So an event is one day a month or one day, you know, one particular day and you've got to be there and then when it's over it's over uh what we discovered is that the scorecard's available 24 hours a day seven days a week and people they just go online and connect with it and start answering it and then our our sales people pick up the phone and say hey it looks like you scored really well for this one and really badly for this one do you want to improve that yeah we can help you with that and they were having the best fastest conversions that they'd ever had off the back of the scorecard data so this worked really well and my business, my other business exploded. So then my clients start saying, can I get one of these scorecard things? Um, I would like to put, I'm going to publish a book. I'd like to put one in my book or I'm going to launch an event. I'd like to have a scorecard with my event. So we built about seven or eight of these bespoke on WordPress and they all worked across different industries. We had a DJ scorecard, a learning and development scorecard, HR related scorecard. They're all working really well. And that's where in 2020, we said, let's build a platform so it makes it super cheap, super fast, super easy for people to go do this. Um, and we've got 2,000 clients now who use these scorecards as, as their uh, lead generation. So what everyone seems to be doing is just plugging it into their existing content. So they go back through their old videos and they say, call to action in the notes, uh, you know, take the scorecard. They go through all their old podcasts and they update the show notes go take the scorecard. If you want to improve this, take the scorecard. Um, they go and they put it on their website with a banner and a pop-up um, and they put it on the bottom of their top red uh, uh, blogs. And then a lot of people have started running ads to these as well. So we now discover that you can actually run ads, Facebook ads, Google ads, YouTube ads, and the call to action on the ad is if you'd like to improve this thing, go and take this scorecard and find out whether you're on track or off track. And um, really powerful ads. Uh, one of the most common ads that we recommend people is what we call the are you ready to blank ad. Um, so are you ready to become a better CEO? Are you ready to um, scale your business? Are you ready to run a marathon? Are you ready to be a better parent? Um, take the scorecard. So this ad is actually a really powerful ad that people just run the ads. Um, we're seeing a lot of people getting um, between 10 and $20 per scorecard lead. Now, for a lot of B2B businesses, if you get, you know, 100 leads for two grand, uh, off the back of that, you're going to do 60, 80, 100,000 worth of business. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty effective to know who to talk to. The other thing too, a lot of our clients, they deal with what I would call Cinderella clients. And Cinderella clients is you've got to fit the glass slipper unless, right? If you don't fit the glass slipper, if you're not a perfect fit, there's not a lot we can do with you. We have to rapidly find out whether we can help you or not. Um, so the, the frustrating thing, let's say, for example, you're a consultant who works with manufacturing companies that have between 50 and 500 employees. You want to know as fast as possible, is this person manufacturing 50 to 500 employees, right? And, and has this particular issue. So the scorecard very rapidly says, okay, out of these hundred people who filled in the scorecard, only three of them are the right people to talk to. So it's kind of, it acts as the glass slipper. Um, that uh, that finds finds Cinderella for you. So um, the the promoting strategy is embedded into all the communication. Talk about yourself, but at the end of every sentence, invite people to talk about themselves by filling in the scorecard. Well, as you're talking, I start thinking about 
uh, you say uh, my, my ideal customer profile, you talked about the Cinderella and the glass step you know, finding the right fit and doing all that. I start also thinking about, especially in the B2B, this, you know, put on the B2B hat and mindset. You know, if I have a high ticket, you know, type of scenario, as far as my solution is concerned, whether it's services or whether it's products, is who is taking my quiz? And am I really going to get an executive, you know, person who can actually you know, drive decisions and, and support and champion decisions throughout the business? Or am I getting that person down low that really they're just curious? I mean, how, how in the heck do you actually not chase smoke? How do you, I mean, because I mean, I mean, when, when we figure out my Cinderella criteria, I mean, how yeah. does all that come into play? Well, so I'll give you an example, Jim, behind you, you've got a stack of books mm -hmm. and every, here's the thing, every single one of those books in the moment that you were reading that book, you were totally in love with that author at that particular time, right? So you're reading their book, you're into the story, you're into their method, you're into their insights, and you're just devouring the book and going, gee, this is great. And then there comes a point where you finish the book and you go, that was a good book. And then you're on to the next one. And uh, and that, that author is now kind of in the past and that's it, right? And I bet Every single one of the books that you've got behind you, I bet there was a moment where you're like, oh, that's a great idea. I've got to do something with that. That's a great idea. And in that moment, in, in that particular week that you were reading that book, if there was somewhere, somehow that the author knew that was the time to call you and that was the time to have a chat with you about the content in that book, you would, you would be like so ready to sign up. And you're a CEO, right? You're an you're a, uh, executive kind of guy. So uh, one of the best things is just, if the content is good, right, and it's got to be good content. If you, if you, let's be real. If you're going to deal with CEOs and executives and and leaders, they love content. They love HBR. They love personality profiles. They love reading books. They love listening to good quality podcasts. So you've got to have some good content. But the difference is that you you strap that to a, a signaling mechanism where it's like you've listened to this audio book now take the scorecard to see whether you're ready to apply the ideas and the principles that ceo will absolutely want to save themselves time and focus in on the area that's most valuable to them uh if they're engaging with that content they'll take the scorecard okay so uh all right <laughs> and there's so many there's so many things when i start looking at going i still I kind of come back full circle as far as the complexity of this i mean you know and and thinking about how can i be led to success um and and i start wondering about the possibilities of that and also the shifts so one of the things you talked about you know hbr and, and things like that you know mckenzie and all these things that you know a lot of uh, you know business executives are focused in on is <clears throat> there's an acronym that's called vuca which is volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and i've been talking a lot about it lately because quite frankly i think it's something that we're dealing with every single day and it's never gonna end you know, deal with it, learn how to manage VUCA better, right? So if, if I start thinking about, I go through this entire process, I put a lot of effort into it, I start promoting, things start happening, and I have a freaking VUCA shift, right? So that the world changed on me. COVID, the world changed on me. You know, all of these things start happening is... <clears throat> You know, how, how do I continue to use this as something that is predictable, right? Because, I mean, I'm putting up a sales forecast. I'm setting expectations. I have to meet those numbers. You know, how, how can I make sure uh, that I don't have the problems of, hey, it worked for a little bit, and then I fell off that cliff? So uh, for, for starters, uh, it may do that, right? It absolutely might fall off a cliff. You might come up with something that's incredibly topical, uh, you know, the best-selling book last year is no longer the best-selling book anymore. It was the best-selling book last year. So things do tend to fall off a cliff. They have a long tail. Uh, so you might have a piece of content and you also might have a, a scorecard that's very topical and it's very hot right now and generating leads. The good thing about this is that unlike a book or a podcast, uh, you can just tweak it, you change it, uh, you can very easily update the landing pages. You can update the questions that you're asking. You can update the results that you're giving people. So you can, it, it's, it's dynamic, it's real time, it's editable um, and, uh, and it's very easy to change. So, uh, you know, let's say for example, 
uh, you know, 2016, you create the Are You Brexit Ready scorecard and then you change it to the Are You COVID Ready scorecard and now you change it to the Are You Inflation Ready scorecard. Um, so you can just change that and just and just make some shifts with it. Um, now, with that said, data is always going to be an asset. So the fact that you've got data um, and your company owns that data and you've, you've collected and accumulated that data, that data is going to be a great conversation starter with, let's say, let's say for example, someone did take the Brexit Ready scorecard in 2016 and they're sitting on my database. And I pick up the phone and say, hey, look, in 2016, you took a scorecard, said that you were not ready for Brexit. Um, and I just want to check in with you. How did it all unfold? How did it go? Um, where are you at now? Now, that's, that's a piece of data that you can go back and say, well, in 2016, you said that you were really struggling with your marketing message and you said you didn't have any in-house counsel and that was an issue. Right, I've got all this data about you and you know, have, you, have you improved any of that stuff? So um, you know, data is always going to be an asset. Uh, there's, you know, it's an incredible asset. So collect it, uh, but if you need to change, change. Uh, I find it difficult with book. I've written four best-selling books. Uh, the problem is, is that you know they're hot for a while, and then you got to write another one. Um, it's a lot easier to do a scorecard than write another book. <laughs> well, okay. So as you were also talking, I started thinking about you know this information that's getting divulged to us becomes data, and I start thinking about so many things that have changed as far as the privacy landscape, you know, and GDPR all of that. So and mm. how does all of that come into play when you start talking about these scorecards and data? Yeah. So for starters, we have in-house counsel that, um, or, or not in-house, we have a uh, contracted counsel on GDPR at our company to make sure that we are GDPR compliant. At the essence of GDPR, there are restrictions around how data is stored and managed from a technical perspective. Uh, there's also essentially at the essence of it, it's about putting people in control of their own data. So if you reach out, Jim, and say, have you got any data about me on your system? Then as a business, I need to be able to say, yeah, we do. And here's what we know about you. And here's the record. And then you can say, can you delete all of that? And we go, absolutely, we can. And then we do. And we actually do. So essentially, that's the, you know, when you get into the regulation around data, that's the essence of it. That's the big major thread that the consumer is in control of what the data says about them and that they can ask for it to be deleted um, and it can be, et cetera, right? And that they've also given some form of permission. So there's consent in terms of collection of data. Now, when it comes to consent, um, when you're harvesting data about people uh, and they have absolutely no idea about that happening, that's on the extreme end. When people are deliberately filling in a questionnaire in order to get a scorecard, there's actually, you're, you're really close to what's called implied consent, right? You are interacting with the system, which of, obviously by answering a set of questions to get a scorecard, you're actually consenting to putting you know, data into the system. You're consciously doing it. So with that said, there is, there, there obviously we have terms and conditions. There is a, a high degree of implied consent with that system. And also we follow all of those regulations that if someone wanted to delete any records that we have, it's very easy to identify those records and delete them permanently. Okay, so realistic expectations. Um, if, I, if I start looking at, I am a high ticket B2B sales. You know, I have typically a longer sales cycle. That's a year, you know, to two years uh, because I have to build a relationship. I have buying committees. I have all these things going. I mean, how long is it going to take for something like this as far as, uh, results are concerned. I have to go through all the process of setting this up. I have to now promote. I have to do all these other things. Well, give me an understanding of. Good, good. Let me give you a great example. I'll give you a really fabulous example. So there's a guy who's one of our clients and he does uh, what you would call mindfulness training uh, within large organizations. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce the amount of stress and they actually work in hospitals and they work with nurses in particular, a lot of, a lot of work with nurses and uh, people who uh, encounter trauma, they encounter sick people, they encounter you know blood and guts, all that sort of stuff. So it's a very high stress environment, and especially in the last couple of years, it's been an extremely stressful environment, under under resourced and and uh, lot, lots to do. So he he has a solution that's evidence based around teaching people proactive skills, how to manage their stress, how to 
um, use the right language around stress, all that sort of stuff. But it's very kind of touchy feely to a degree. Like it's, it's a little bit kind of, you know, <laughs> um, warm and fuzzy when you start talking about mindfulness and, you know, stress and all that sort of stuff. So here's what happened. He goes into uh, HR uh, and they've got, in this particular area, they've got 70 nurses in this particular hospital. And he says, what I'd like to do is run a scorecard with your nurses and they answer all these questions. And then we actually find out whether there's any issue to address. And then we can also, at a later date, if we do, we can see whether we've had an impact on that. So they get these 70 nurses to answer the questions. Now, one of the big questions that came up was a question, how often do you think about resigning? How often do you think about quitting? Um, and it was something ridiculous, like 60, 70% said weekly. Um, <laughs> it was like pretty horrific. And when they took that back to HR, they said, look, you've got like 60% of your nurses who think about quitting every single week. This is not good. Um, it costs 8,000 to recruit a new one and it costs 8,000 to train a new one. So uh, you really like just not, that's like a trained one to bring them on board as eight grand. So it's like 16 grand if they actually do quit. Um, and then there was a bunch of other things too about, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how, how, how positive do you feel about your job? And it's like an average of a three. So these, these are not happy people, right? So the data quantified it. The data actually wrapped numbers around this thing that was kind of up in the air. So immediately he wins a, a, a trial uh, project with this hospital. They go through and they do a three-month uh, program where they uh, teach the nurses uh, stress-related uh, coping mechanisms and strategies and um, how to you know, manage it and how to uh, respond in certain different ways and all, all the stuff that they do, right? And then at the end of three months, they take the same scorecard again and sure enough, there's been a significant improvement, right? And they can show it. They can show that it's gone from a three to a six. They can show that it's gone from weekly to monthly, um, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it basically shows there's been a real reduction in the levels of stress and an improvement in, in uh, the likelihood of retention. So that program is now being rolled out to a much wider network of nurses in the, in the health organization. So that's a great example of how it sped up the, the cycle of buying, um, how it took something that was kind of like a, what immediately on the surface feels warm and fuzzy and turned it into data and it turned it into actual money um, lost or opportunity cost and all those sorts of things. And then it showed, look, we've moved the needle on this. We've actually done what we said we could do. Uh, and here's the data. So, um, you know, so that would be a great example that I think meets what you, what you mentioned. Oh, definitely. Thanks for sharing that example. Okay. So five reasons why quiz funnel marketing sucks. Well, first of all, don't call it a quiz, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> give them a reason uh, to, you know, to take it, to give them some value. Yeah. Go ahead and go run through those real quick for me. Yeah, so um, it, it would suck if you didn't give people a self-interested reason to take the scorecard, if, if they think they're helping you versus helping themselves. Um, number two is asking the right number of questions depending where they are in the sales cycle. Keep it light at the beginning. Build up if, you're, if you've got someone in the pipeline and then go all in if you've got a, a client that you want to track and measure. Um, number three is... Um, uh, giving value straight away. So making sure that when someone completes answering the questions, they immediately get custom recommendations, custom insights, that we do the personalization, that the data is used for personalization, that you're not just then, they're not answering questions and then getting a generic response. They're answering questions and getting a personalized response based on the data. Number four is promoting it effectively, plugging it into all of your marketing to create the two-way conversation. And number five is using the data uh, to to uh, to make more sales and to be more effective. Daniel Priestley, awesome insight. How does the B2B DM gang get in touch with you? So visit scoreapp.com and you can activate a, uh, a free trial. In fact, I'm going to make sure, Jim, that we give you a, a link in your show notes that people can get double the free trial. So normally it's 14 days. We'll get you a link for 30-day free trial. Um, once you activate a free trial, we invite you to our monthly workshop. So you can do something called setup and score, which is where we help and support you with, with setup. Um, we can actually get you in touch with, if you, if you want some done for you or done with you services, we can get those, uh, available to you. Um, and, and we can give, plug you into all of our resources so you can do this right. Um, feel free to follow me on social media at Daniel Priestley. Um, uh, if you want to follow my, 
uh, random musings. Uh, and um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to connect. I'm going to put a new book out, of course, called Scorecard Marketing. So I'd love to get get your listeners a copy of that if they want to listen to that or, or, or read that as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to going on a journey with with your community and and seeing some of them massively succeed and transform their marketing with scorecards. And Daniel Priestley, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. And we wish you the very best. Cheers, Tim. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.